Ivan, I'm uh, Dr. Rizwana, working as a professor of physics in the Institute of Aeronautical Engineering. Uh, today, we are going to discuss a very important property exhibited by ferromagnetic materials. In my last video, I have discussed in detail about uh, different magnetic materials and what are the different properties exhibited by magnetic materials. So, we have uh, seen that uh, when generally when we talk about uh, magnetic materials, uh, we talk in terms of their electron spins. So, and uh, what we are going to observe here is, uh, we know that uh, if we take any magnetic material and if we apply magnetic field, suppose if we take a material which is magnetic in nature and if we keep it in magnetic field, then what we are going to observe here is their orbitals as well as spins, they are going to orient with respect to magnetic field. And because of that orientation, they act as magnetic dipole and each atom, because it is in the state of a magnetic dipole, it causes some magnetic moment. And depending upon alignment of this magnetic moment vector associated with each atom, then properties of different magnetic materials is going to vary. We have seen that when we talk in terms of, uh, of course, orientation of orbitals and orientation of their spins, we have seen that major contribution uh, to uh, this magnetism. So, when we talk about this magnetism, major contribution it comes because of spins, electron spins. So, major contribution it comes because of electron spins and very negligible contribution it comes because of orbital motion of electron. So, that's why when we try to explain different types of magnetic materials, we'll try to explain them based on their electron spins. And as uh, when we talk about uh, different types of magnetic materials, so when we talk about uh, different types of magnetic materials, so when we take these magnetic materials, so, what we are going to observe here is, and when we explain these materials based on their electron spins, we know that we have uh, diamagnetic materials, and then we have uh, paramagnetic materials, and that of course we have ferromagnetic materials. And we have seen that of these three different types of uh, magnetic materials, ferromagnet is a strong magnet. And whereas if we talk about diamagnets, generally they have this property of getting repelled by a magnet. So, these uh, diamagnets, they will actually get a magnetization in the direction opposite to field. So, they show this property of repulsion once we bring magnetic field to these materials and then we have paramagnetic materials but their attraction towards the magnet it will be very weak and also when we place them in external magnetic field they will get magnetized in a direction opposite to field. So, they are weakly magnetized but coming to ferromagnetic materials. When we talk about these ferromagnetic materials, they are strong magnets and when we place them in external magnetic field, they will acquire very high magnetization and that magnetization direction is same as magnetizing field. So, direction of magnetization is same as uh, field direction applied and when we talk about electron spins, we have seen that in diamagnetic materials, uh, generally, uh, they consist of even number of electrons and this even number of electrons they form electron spins. So, where direction of spin of electron is completely opposite to the direction of spin of the other electron. So, that is why there are no left out single electrons. So, here when we talk about diamagnetic materials and when we consider each atom, we will say that each atom it has got zero magnetic moment. So, we talk about zero magnetic moment when we consider each atom of diamagnetic materials. But when we are talking about paramagnetic materials, so here of course there are left out single electrons, but uh, electron spin direction or magnetic moment vector direction of all those uh, magnetic dipoles, they are randomly oriented. So, that is why they possess very small amount of permanent magnetic moment but coming to ferromagnetic materials and when we talk in terms of their spins, we will observe that all the electron spins, they are oriented in the same direction, whereas in paramagnetic material, all the spins are randomly oriented. So, all the spins, they are randomly oriented. So, that is why they possess very small magnetic moment. But when we talk about ferromagnetic materials, because all their electron spins are oriented in the same direction. So, that is why they possess large magnetization. So, here magnetization is very large. So, that is why we call these ferromagnets to be very strong magnets. And uh, talking about uh, properties exhibited by these ferromagnets, we know that uh, these uh, ferromagnets, they show very high values of relative permeabilities and uh, generally they have very high values of uh, uh, 
of course uh, this uh, magnetic flux density also because when we keep our ferromagnet in external magnetic field and when we talk about their permeabilities we will observe that there is very high penetration of magnetic lines of forces. So we have very high penetration of magnetic lines of forces. So if we consider magnetic fee, uh, flux density inside and if we consider magnetic flux density outside and what we are going to observe here is flux density inside it will be very much greater than flux density outside the ferromagnetic material. So here we have very high penetration. So that's why the relative permeability values are also very high and they are of uh, order of hundreds and thousands. So here this is about these uh, ferromagnets. Now coming to one special property exhibited by a ferromagnet and that special property it is called as hysteresis curve. So that special property it is called as hysteresis curve. So when we talk about uh, this hysteresis curve exhibited by ferromagnetic materials, so what exactly is hysteresis curve? Now if you look at the definition for hysteresis curve, we will define the uh, hysteresis as it refers to the lagging of magnetization of a ferromagnetic material. So here in generally in hysteresis curve, we talk about how magnetization lags of a ferromagnetic material and of course we know that when we consider ferromagnetic material best example is iron. Or if you want to define this hysteresis curve in other words, we can say that when a ferromagnetic material is magnetized in one direction, then it will not relax back to zero magnetization even if the applied magnetizing field is removed. So it won't go back to this initial stage of having zero magnetization when applied field is zero. So this is the most important property of this hysteresis curve. Now in order to understand this hysteresis curve better, so as you can see in this figure given in this slide, so this is the hysteresis curve exhibited by ferromagnetic material and what exactly is this hysteresis curve? It is the plot taken between uh, magnetic flux density and magnetizing field H. So on y-axis generally we will take magnetic flux density B which is also called as intensity of magnetization I. So on y-axis what we are going to do? We are going to take either magnetic flux density. What is magnetic flux density? It is defined as number of magnetic lines of forces crossing per unit area due to magnetizing field and also due to induction property of material. And also we are saying that what is the other parameter which we can take? We can also take magnetization I and this magnetization I it is referred by I. In some books it is also referred by M. So M or I, they refer to intensity of magnetization and how we'll define intensity of magnetization? Intensity of magnetization is defined as induced magnetic movement per unit volume of magnetic material. And whereas when we talk about magnetic flux density, it is taken as magnetic flux per unit area. And when we talk in terms of their units, intensity of magnetization, its units, it is taken as ampere per meter. Whereas when we talk about magnetic flux density, its units, it is taken as Weber per meter square or it is simply taken as Tesla. Okay. And then on X axis, what we are doing, we are taking. So what is this H? H it is called as magnetic field intensity or it is also called as magnetizing field. So it is called as magnetic uh, field intensity or simply it is called as magnetizing field. Okay, and what is the unit for this H? H unit, it will be same as intensity of magnetization, which is taken as ampere per meter. So when we take this plot by taking magnetizing field on x-axis and then intensity of magnetization or magnetic flux density on y-axis, that particular curve, it is called as hysteresis curve. And what is the shape of the curve exhibited by ferromagnetic material? Now to understand this curve better, so we'll try to draw, draw this curve, uh, sorry, curve separately. So slowly one by one, we'll see how this uh, hysteresis uh, curve will uh, like uh, magnetization. We talk in terms of magnetization, how magnetization or magnetic flux density it is going to follow our external magnetizing field. So by drawing this figure again, we are going to just try to understand what exactly is this hysteresis curve exhibited by ferromagnetic material. Now I have taken a ferromagnetic material. Now I'm going to draw a 
for easy convenience of understanding. So I have taken a hysteresis curve which is exhibited by ferromagnetic materials and this is very important property exhibited by ferromagnetic materials and because of this uh, property they are used in memories so they are used in non-volatile memories where data will not be lost even if power goes off so they have this property of retaining magnetization even when magnetic field is reduced to zero. Now as I told you this hysteresis curve first thing is when we talk about this curve we will say that it is the plot taken by taking magnetizing field H on X axis and by taking magnetic flux density or intensity of magnetization M on Y axis. So it can be MH curve or simply it can be taken as BH curve. So it is MH curve or it is taken as BH curve. So what we are taking on uh, x-axis, we are taking magnetizing field or magnetic field intensity and what we are taking on y-axis, we are taking intensity of magnetization or we can also take magnetic flux density. Okay, now first this is our starting point. So this is our starting point and as we know that it is of course 0, 0 point. Now at this point we are saying that our externally applied field which is called as magnetic field intensity or magnetizing field. So at this particular point H is 0 as well as magnetization associated with ferromagnetic material is also 0. So at this point no externally applied field so no magnetization associated with it. Ferromagnet. Now after this point what we will do slowly we will keep on increasing the strength of H. So what we will do slowly we will keep on increasing H values we will we'll go in this direction. So slowly I am increasing intensity of uh, external magnetic field that is nothing but our H. Then what is the path followed by magnetization. So what we are going to see here is as H is increasing so here magnetization also increases so it increases it goes along this path increases 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 and then it goes to the saturation magnetization so it goes to this saturation magnetization so as you can see here as h is increasing magnetization is also increasing it takes along this path and this is the initial path taken by ferromagnetic materials so at this point first H is 0, magnetization is also 0. So as H is increased, magnetization is also increasing, increasing. And then as you can see, it comes to a point, okay, where even though we keep on increasing our H, then what happens to magnetization? There won't be any change in magnetization. It means that our ferromagnet, it has come to saturation level. So this ferromagnet, it has got... Uh, like magnetized to its full extent or it has reached its saturation magnetization magnetization so that's why even though when we keep on increasing so when we keep on increasing our h value also there won't be any change in magnetization value and this particular magnetization it is denoted by ms so it is given by ms so what is our ms ms refers to saturation magnetization so this MS refers to saturation magnetization. Right. So what we have taken here first, uh, where are we? We are at the point where H is 0, magnetization is also 0. As H increases, what happens to magnetization? Magnetization also increases and then it goes to its saturation value. Now, after reaching this saturation magnetization, after this point, what we'll try to do now, I'll try to reduce my H back to zero. So, after coming to this point, what we are going to do, we are going to reduce H to zero. So, we are reducing our H value to zero. Then, uh, actually, uh, this uh, ferromagnet, it should take its magnetization curve along this path it should come down to zero value along this path but what we'll observe here is it won't take this initial path but it will create its own path so as slowly we keep on reducing h then what happens to magnetization of course it decreases but it goes along the new path and uh, when we come to this value of zero magnetization there is some magnetization associated with ferromagnet so now as you can see what we have done after reaching this point of saturation magnetization I started reducing H to 0. 
So when we started reducing H2 to zero instead of taking initial path and instead of coming to this point of uh, H0 and being zero, what it will do, it will uh, create a new path and then it comes to this point where magnetic field is zero and then magnetization is not equal to zero. It means that there is some magnetization retained by ferromagnet and that magnetization it is called as remanent magnetization or simply it is called as retentivity. So what is our MR? So MR uh, simply it is called as retentivity or it is called as remanent magnetization. So it is called as remnant magnetization. So what is remnant magnetization? Remnant magnetization, it is defined as the magnetization retained by a ferromagnet even our H is removed, like it is reduced back to zero. So even when we have reduced our H to zero, there is some magnetization retained by a ferromagnet and that magnetization it is called as uh, this remnant magnetization. Now we are at this point where our H is zero but magnetization it is not zero, it has got some value, that value is MR. Now I want to bring this magnetization to zero, I want to bring this remnant magnetization to zero. Then after coming to H zero, I start applying magnetic field in opposite direction. So we'll go in opposite direction. So here I'll start applying magnetizing field in opposite direction, then what happens to remnant magnetization or this remnant magnetization? It starts decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. So actually it goes along this path. So right. So if we take this path, it will go along this path. Okay. And what we are going to observe here is in this path, as you can observe, at one particular uh, magnetizing field, this remnant magnetization, it has come to zero. Now, as you can see, this is the path followed by magnetization curve exhibited by ferromagnet when we uh, apply magnetic field in opposite direction. So, what is happening to magnetization? Magnetization is reducing and there exists one negative magnetic field or negative magnetizing field and we call that negative magnetizing field as minus Hc. Okay. So, what is this uh, magnetizing field? It is referred by minus Hc. Now, what is my magnetic field applied? Of course, Hc, that is magnetic field, but of course, because we are applying it in the negative direction. Now, what happened at this point? Our magnetization it has come to zero. So here, now this Hc, of course, it is minus, so it is called as negative corsive field, or generally, this Hc, simply it is called as corsivity. So it is called as corsivity or simply it is called as corsive field. So it is called as corsive field. And how we are going to define corsive field? Actually, we'll say that it is the magnetic field required to bring remnant magnetization to zero. So it's the field required to bring the remnant magnetization to zero. Okay, now first we were at this point where H is zero but magnetization is not zero. Now we are at this stage where uh, magnetization is zero but H is not equal to zero. Still we didn't come to the stage where H is zero, magnetization is also zero. Now after coming to this point, still I started applying magnetic field in the opposite direction. I am increasing the magnetic field in opposite direction. Then what happens to magnetization now? Magnetization, it started increasing in negative direction. So this is negative magnetization. So what happens to magnetization? It will take along this path. And uh, what we are going to observe here is as the magnetic field increases, then negative uh, magnetization also increases and then it goes to negative saturation. So what is negative saturation magnetization? So even if I increase my magnetizing field, there won't be any increase in negative magnetization. So it has come to its negative saturation. So this particular point, it is called as minus ms. So this is called as minus ms. What is our ms? Ms is our saturation magnetization because I have kept a minus ms. So it is negative saturation magnetization. Now, after coming to this stage, now what we are going to do, we are going to reduce our negative magnetic field to zero. So, we are coming back to zero. 
So after coming to negative saturation, I started reducing negative magnetic field to zero. Then what it is going to do instead of taking this path, it will create its new path and then it goes along this direction. Okay, so it has come to this point and this particular point, it is called as minus MR. It means that we are talking about negative remnant magnetization. So as you can see what I have done, I have reduced my minus H back to zero. So when we have reduced this negative field back to zero, so again we have come to a point where magnetic field is zero but magnetization is not zero. And what is that magnetization? It is called as remnant magnetization and of course it is negative. Okay. Now after coming to this point, we didn't uh, stop to zero magnetic field but I started applying magnetic field, positive magnetic field. So we started applying magnetic field in the positive direction. Then what happens to magnetization? Now as you can see magnetization is decreasing. So this magnetization decreases, decreases, decreases and then there exists one particular magnetic field HC at which this negative remnant magnetization will become zero. So at this particular HC and what is our HC already we have defined it is called as coercivity or coercive uh, field and what is coercive field is the field required to bring remnant magnetization to zero. Okay, and here we have come across uh, two types of coercive field. One is positive coercive field, another one is negative coercive field. What is positive coercive field? Positive coercive field is the field required to bring negative remnant magnetization to zero, whereas negative coercive field is the field required to bring positive remnant magnetization to zero. Okay, so at this point of positive field that is HC, what happened to negative remnant magnetization it has become zero. So we are at the point where M is zero but H is not zero. And I didn't stop applying positive field if I keep on increasing strength of positive magnetic field. Then magnetization it start increasing in this direction and again it goes to this point of positive saturation. Again, it goes to this point of positive saturation. So this is the path followed by this. And then after that, finally, it will follow this path. And again, it goes to this positive saturation. Now, again, after coming to this positive saturation, so if I bring my this uh, magnetization back to zero, again, it will come to this point of uh, remnant magnetization. And then if I apply magnetic field in negative direction, it will go along this path and at this uh, negative coercive field, magnetization will become zero. And if I still apply negative field, it goes to negative saturation. And then if I apply, if I reduce minus H value back to zero, again, it goes to negative remnant magnetization, sorry, negative saturation magnetization. Of course, the first it will increase, go to saturation. If we reduce our minus, minus H to back to zero, then uh, at H is equal to zero, then there is some magnetization retained, that is negative remnant magnetization. And if I start increasing H in positive direction, magnetization, it will decrease and it will come to zero value at HC. And if we further apply positive field, again, it goes to saturation magnetization. So that's why first thing is when we talk about hysteresis curve, we'll say that it's a cyclic process. So first point, we'll say that it is a cyclic process and second point is when we talk about ferromagnet we'll say that it represents irreversible property of so it represents irreversible property of ferromagnet so hysteresis curve so here we are talking about hysteresis curve first thing what we are going to say here is first thing is here we are going to say that it's a cyclic process and second one what we are going to uh, say here is it represents irreversible property of ferromagnet. Now why it is called as irreversible uh, property of ferromagnet or some, simply we can say that magnetization lags behind applied field. So one more point what we can add when we talk about hysteresis curve is magnetization lags behind Applied magnetic field. Okay. So it lags behind applied magnetic field. Now what is the meaning of this irreversible property and magnetization lagging behind applied magnetic field? See what is our initial point? Our initial point is this. So this is our initial point where 
our h is zero as well as magnetization is zero. Now, when uh, of course when we have increased, it has gone to saturation. Now, when I have brought my h to zero, my magnetization it has not become zero. If you observe here at this point, h is zero, but magnetization is not zero. Whereas at this point, magnetization is zero, but h is not zero. And coming to this point here in this case, our h is zero, but m is not zero. And at this point, what we are going to observe here is m is zero, but our h is not equal to zero. So once we start applying external field to a ferromagnet, once magnetization process starts, we can never reach to this point where h is zero as well as magnetization is zero. We can never come back to this point where magnetization becomes zero as h will become zero. So that's why it is called as irreversible property of ferromagnet or simply we'll say that magnetization lags behind applied magnetic field. And one more point associated with hysteresis curve is, so here we'll say that hysteresis loop area. So there is a, this hysteresis loop area Generally, there is a name to this hysteresis loop area. It is called as hysteresis loss. And actually, the, there will be one experiment in the lab, in a physics uh, lab, where uh, we are going to find energy loss associated by a ferromagnet. So, we'll form one uh, circuit by making use of different values of resistance and capacitors. And uh, by making use of ferromagnet, we are going to plot hysteresis curve. And what we are going to observe here is with resistance and capacitance, hysteresis loop area is going to change. And when hysteresis loop area changes, then loss, energy loss associated with ferromagnet is also going to change. This is the experiment which we are going to do it in physics lab. So this is about the hysteresis curve. Okay, so for more clarification, we can look at this curve, which is showing these points, as you can see. Uh, there are different points. So here this is HC and this is minus HC here retentivity and this is uh, negative retentivity. Okay, and here we are talking about saturation in opposite direction and this is our uh, saturation in positive direction and here magnetizing force in uh, opposite direction and of course here we are talking about negative positive as well as negative or positive flux density. Okay, so this is about the hysteresis curve. Now, Coming to very important concept related to ferromagnet and when we try to explain hysteresis curve, first we should get familiar with this domain theory or this theory of ferromagnetism. So there is one theory which is proposed by this which tries to explain why these ferromagnets are strong magnets. And according to scientist Wiss, what is he saying here is as we know that in ferromagnet each atom it is in the state of a magnetic dipole. So if you take ferromagnet, each atom, it is in the state of a magnetic dipole. It means that each atom, it will have its magnetic moment vector in one particular direction. So what we are understanding here is we know that if we take a ferromagnet, if we take each atom of a ferromagnet, each atom, it will act as a strong magnetic dipole. So there is magnetic moment associated with the dipole and that magnetic moment direction or vector direction. So it, uh, of course, that magnetic moment vector, it will be in one particular direction. So now what we are going to observe here is here we have ferromagnets consisting of uh, such many atoms. Okay, and each atom, as I told you, it is associated with uh, magnetic moment vector direction. Now, what you're going to observe here is there exist certain interactive forces or that force, it is also called as exchange force. There is some interactive force or exchange force that exists between atoms of a ferromagnet. And what is the role played by such force, what this force will do, that force it will try to align magnetic moment vector or electron spin direction, okay, same as it. So suppose I have two atoms and one atom it has got electron spin direction or magnetic moment vector direction in this way and I have another atom very closer to it and this atom it has got magnetic moment vector in this direction. Now what I am saying here is of course here we are talking about two atoms which are very nearby and as we said that there exists some interaction force or there is some exchange force and because of that force what these uh, two atoms will try to do these two atoms they will try to get their spins electron spin direction or magnetic moment vector direction same. 
okay so all such atoms which are having electron spin direction or magnetic moment vector direction in the same way they'll come together and they'll form one region and what is that region called as domain so what is the domain domain is nothing but a small region and what is the dimension of that region we'll take it as 10 to the power of minus 6 meters and this domain it consists of collection of atoms and these atoms electron spins or magnetic moment vectors are oriented in the same direction and why their electron spins or magnetic moment vectors are oriented in the same direction because there exists some interaction interact, uh, interaction force or exchange force so as you can see in this particular figure we have many domains you know if i consider this domain in this domain what is the direction of all magnetic moment vectors they are in this direction they are aligned in the same direction and if you consider this domain they are aligned in this direction of course here in this direction means that when i go from one domain to another domain then direction of magnetization is different so direction of magnetization is different when we go from one domain to another domain and of course when we go for each domain in each domain all the atoms or electron spins or magnetic moment vectors they are oriented in the same direction okay but when we go from one domain to another domain direction of magnetization is changing so that's why what we'll say that ferromagnet it consists of random domains so it consists of random domains why we are saying that they consist of random domains because direction of magnetization of uh, one domain it will be completely different from another domain it means that ferromagnet consists of random domains so that's why their net magnetic moment is zero or net magnetization is zero okay but each domain it will be in the state of spontaneous magnetization so each domain it is in the state of spontaneous magnetization why we'll say that it is in the state of spontaneous magnetization because even if i don't apply external field all the domains they got oriented uh, like all the magnetic moment vectors or electron spins they are oriented in the same direction giving rise to magnetization so that's why we'll say that each domain it is in the state of uh, spontaneous magnetization because of parallel alignment of all magnetic dipoles even when there is no external field but all the domains are randomly oriented so that's why net magnetization is zero okay now when we have such random domains what happens when we apply external field to such random domains so there are two possible ways of alignment of domains on application of external magnetic field what are those two process first process is motion of domain wall or simply it is called as domain wall movement so this is called as domain wall moment. So once we have random domains in ferromagnet, when we apply external magnetic field, so there are two ways of alignment of uh, domains, random domains. First method, it is called as domain wall moment. And second one, it is called as uh, rotation of domain walls or it is called as, uh, of course, uh, uh, domain rotation. Okay, so here, so these are two methods. Now, in order to understand these two methods, we are considering this figure. So, if we look at this figure, now what is our first figure? First figure is our ferromagnet. So, this is our ferromagnet, and to this ferromagnet, we have not applied any external magnetic field. So, we didn't apply any magnetic field. So, zero magnetic field. Now, what are these arrows? These arrows. So each one it will represent domain. So what is a domain? Domain is a region which is uh, which is having uh, or which is a collection of uh, atoms whose uh, magnetic uh, moment vectors are uh, oriented in the same direction. So this is one domain whose direction of magnetization is in this direction. Now this is another domain where direction of magnetization is in other direction. This is another one. So this is to show that a ferromagnet consists of all possible domains having direction of magnetization in different directions. So when we go from one domain to another domain, direction of magnetization is changing. Right? Now to such ferromagnet having random domains where net magnetization is zero, Okay, and but what we have to understand here is each domain it is in the state of spontaneous magnetization. 
but when we are going from one domain to another domain because magnetization direction is changing so that's why net magnetization is zero now to such ferromagnet having random domains if i apply magnetic field in this direction and what is the notation for externally applied magnetic field it is denoted by h so if you apply magnetic field h in this direction now this particular process this is our first method of magnetization taking place and what exactly it is called it is called domain wall movement so this is called domain wall movement or what is the one more name given so it is also called as motion of domain wall but before understanding about this process first we should know what exactly is domain wall as you can see if i take these two adjacent domains okay these two adjacent domains they are separated by a boundary so there is one boundary okay so this boundary it is called as domain wall so this boundary it is called as domain wall so how will define domain wall domain wall is nothing but boundary that separates two adjacent domains oriented in different direction whose direction of magnetization is a uh, different okay so talking about this domain wall moment now if you just if i compare this figure with our figure this figure where we are not applying any external field as you can see this domain volume has increased okay at the expense of other domains right so as you can see this domain volume has increased whereas volume of the other domains has decreased and which domains volume has decreased domains whose direction of magnetization is in other direction now because i am applying h in this direction so volume of which domain has increased volume of domain whose direction of magnetization is same as h has increased what does it indicate it indicates that some of the atoms which belongs to other domains they have their magnetization direction getting oriented in the same direction as h and they'll come into this domain okay or number of atoms whose direction of magnetization is in this direction they increase so that's why this volume of domain is increasing and this volume of domain increasing it is taken as if this domain wall is moving okay because volume of domain has increased so that's why we'll take it as domain wall moment so what exactly is happening slowly slowly each atom direction of magnetization it will start getting oriented along the direction of h okay so that's why number of atoms will increase and they'll come out in this particular domain so that's why volume of this domain is increasing so this is our first method of orientation of domains on application of external magnetic field now coming to the second method what is our second method we said that it is rotation of domain wall now what exactly is actually it is called as rotation of domains it is called as rotation of domains now if we try to compare this figure now one thing what we have to understand here is the second case of course first case is when we are not applying any magnetic field and second case when we are applying weak magnetic field so second case we'll take when we are applying weak magnetic field and whereas third case when i have increased my external field to very high value here we are talking about a strong magnetic field so here we are talking about strong magnetic field now as you can see so what exactly is happening in the third case now all the domains they got oriented in the same direction or direction of magnetization of all domains it is same and it is in which direction it is in the same direction as h this is the direction of h so that's why it means that all the atoms they have their electron spins or magnetic moment vectors got oriented in the same direction and what is the direction of magnetization it is same as external magnetic field h so that's why when we try to recollect our hysteresis curve when so if we go back to our hysteresis curve we have seen that in this hysteresis curve when i have started applying magnetic field we'll go to this saturation magnetization it means that even if we increase our h there won't be any increase in magnetization why because all the domains they got oriented in the same direction so it has reached its maximum magnetization so that's why once rotation of domains takes place at very high magnetic field there won't be any increase in magnetization and then ferromagnet it is going to exhibit saturation 
magnetization. Now, if we try to explain our hysteresis curve based on this domain theory. So, generally we will try to explain it uh, when we are considering our hysteresis curve. Generally, we will take only this path, initial path taken by a ferromagnet. This is the initial path taken by a ferromagnet. So, we have taken H on X axis and we have taken M on Y axis. As we know that slowly as H is increased, this is the path taken and then at high magnetic field, it will go to saturation magnetization. Now, this particular mm. area, suppose if I call this area as O and this point, I will call it as A. And this point we call it as B and this point we call it as C. So this total rise in the magnetization with rise in H value, I have divided it into three regions. So first region is OA region, okay. So where there is a small increase in magnetization. And why there is small increase in uh, magnetization? Because which processes involve reversible domain wall displacement? What is domain wall displacement? It means that volume of domain whose direction of magnetization is same as H has increased. It means that some of the atoms, their magnetic movement vectors, they got oriented in the same direction as H. Okay, but I'm saying that it is reversible. Why it is reversible? Because we didn't go to high value of magnetic field. At this point, if I try to remove my magnetic field back to zero, then it can come back to zero magnetization. So that's why it is called as reversible. But after reaching this point A, if I still continue to apply magnetic field, then magnetization increases, increases and it will go along the path AB. And this increase in magnetization with increase in H, this process it is called as irreversible domain wall displacement. So here also domain wall displacement, it means that some more domains or atoms, some more uh, atoms, uh, they will try to get orient themselves along the field direction. So their number will increase. So that's why magnetization is also increasing. But once I come to this point, I cannot come back to the state of magnetization becoming zero when H is zero. So that's why it is called as irreversible. I cannot come back along this path by bringing H to zero. So that's why this process it is called as irreversible. If I go to very strong magnetic field, as you can see, we have gone to this saturation magnetization. It means that what is the process involved here? Domain rotation, actually, this process, of course, reversible, we are saying. So what is reversible? Of course, it will take this where I can make those uh, domains again randomly oriented by going along this path. Okay, but we cannot come back to this point. Reversible, we are talking in this way. Okay, and because all the domains or all the atoms, they have their magnetic moment vectors oriented in the same direction, that's why we go to saturation magnetization. So, if we try to explain our hysteresis curve based on domain theory, as you can see till here, when we take this magnetization curve, what is the process involved? Process involved is domain wall displacement. Then after this point B, what is the process involved? It is called as domain wall rotation. Okay, so if I try to just look at this figure, so, this makes us understand our hysteresis curve based on domain theory better. So, if I take this particular curve and as you can see the material, it follows non-linear magnetization curve. Okay. And uh, what is the process with the H? What exactly is happening here? As you can see, domains first I have random domains. So, that's why magnetization is zero. Slowly, slowly all the domains, they start orienting in the same direction. So, as you can see, once we come to saturation, what happened to all domains? All domains, they got oriented along the direction of H. Okay. Then after that, if we bring our H back to zero. So, when driving magnetic field is dropped to zero, then ferromagnet, it retains certain degree of magnetization. Now, this is very important. So, as you can see, this point of having remnant magnetization when H is brought to zero, it means that what it is doing, it is retaining considerable degree of magnetization. And because of this property, they are useful as magnetic memory device where they'll store data. Okay, data is non-volatile even if external power supply goes off. Okay, now at this point, our magnetization, it has come to zero. It means that again, we have a random orientation of domains. Again, it goes to negative saturation where we have a magnetization due to rotation of domains. So this is about the hysteresis curve based on domain theory. So today in this video, we have discussed about the hysteresis curve exhibited by very important or we can say functional magnetic material called as ferromagnetic materials.
in that we have come across uh, one very important term which is called as retentivity or remnant magnetization and then after that we try to see why this curve is being ex exhibited and how this explanation was given by scientist Wiss and Wiss has given this uh, magnetization curve based on domains. So generally if we take ferromagnet it has random domains but with field those domains they try to get oriented along the field direction. I hope uh, in this uh, uh, like uh, from this video you are able to understand better about this statistics curve. With this I am going to end my session here. Thank you. Like, share and subscribe. Hit the bell icon for more updates.